Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Happy November. Almost halfway through November. Just shocking. Welcome, welcome. We've got some new names. Hi, everybody. So good to see you. I am Lauren Weston. I'm the Executive Director of Actera Action for a Healthy Planet. I'm really excited to have you here tonight. We have uh, our final speaking um, series tonight with our lecturer, Camille Terry. I'm really excited to introduce her to our audience. We have a couple of slides to make our way through and I am recording this. So if you don't wanna be recorded, please just turn your camera off or change your name. Please also put your questions into the chat. We'll be saving the questions for the end. Wendy on my staff, who some of you would recognize, and I will help facilitate the questions for Camille. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, again, put your questions into the chat and also keep yourself on mute if you're able to. We're here tonight for the global future of electrified mobility, the last of our fall lecture series for 2021. Actera, for some of you that know this, uh, we focus on some key program pillars. Tonight, you're experiencing part of our education pillar, which focuses on public lectures. Our topics for public lectures are wide ranging, and our fall series this year has been about EV mobility, mass electrification, and tonight, what the future of EV mobility and jobs looks like. We're glad to have you here to experience that with us. We also do middle school programming called Youth Be the Change. If you're interested in learning more about that, please put a comment in the chat. We also focus on beneficial electrification, which houses our Carl Knapp Go EV program, which in essence sponsors the conversations tonight because it's so in alignment with that programmatic work that we're doing. We also have our Green at Home series, which is a multi-series that we do a couple times a year focused on induction, solar, um, keep up water heaters, and other electrified appliance technology. Our series this fall has focused on multiple topics. In September, some of you join us for EVs for Equity. We had our guest speaker from EV Noir. We had a panel last month on mass mobility, fleets, and innovation, and then tonight, the global future, future of electrified mobility. We want you to join us for some upcoming events as well. We have plant-based induction cooking class every month with our resident chef, Kelvin Briggs. We're really excited to have this holiday-themed cooking class this month. Hope you can join us on the 17th at 6.30. We have our last Green at Home workshop series for the fall. It's on solar rooftops. Our guest will be Mike Balma from Sunwork. That's November 18th at 6 p.m. Please register through our website if you're interested. And then don't miss our early bird deadline. We have our applications now open. Our early bird deadline is Monday for our Business Environmental Awards. You can visit the website to learn more about the award topics and um, please send us nominations. We're always looking for amazing partners. This is sponsored by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Tonight's speaker, I'm so excited to have Camille here with us. She's the co-founder and CEO of Charger Help. Her bio is on the screen. I have been learning about her over the course of the series and I'm so thrilled to present her to you this evening. She has an amazing background in helping increase equitable access and increased job opportunities for folks trying to get into the space. I'm excited to have her with us tonight. You'll hear from her in just a second. Thank you to Camille, of course, and our series underwriters, the Gillilands and the Newkermans, as well as our series sponsors, the Air District and the Foster. And Camille, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pin you on the screen so that you are our main line of sight. Thank you so much, take it away. Oh, perfect. I am really excited to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Camille Christina Terry. I'm the co-founder um, and, and CEO of Charger Help. And I, the funny thing is I was actually just re-watching um, some videos when I started the company back in January and, and really was thinking about how far um, the company has come and even more just like this industry. Um, so I first started off at a company called EV Connect. Um, we developed software for EV charging stations. Uh, when I started off there, I was driver support. And so what that meant was anytime an EV driver had any issue, 
um, they, they, they called us and they called, talked, spoke to me. And some of their issues were actually about the charging stations. And sometimes their issues were about the EVs themselves of knowing how to know if it was charging or that if it was an issue or where to get a charge at. And I, and I learned a lot very quickly because prior to that role, I really was not exposed um, to the EV industry. But I had a really um, cool opportunity with EV Connect where I was able to build out our call center and our customer experience department and our network operations center. And my last role, I was director of programs. And so I let the team that, that built out uh, the, the infra Electrify America infrastructure, as well as a lot of utility programs. And then we ended up um, white labeling our software um, to a, a company out in Australia and a, and a company out in Canada. So I was able to, to, to learn, you know, just all of the different components that made up this industry. And it was quite fascinating. But one of the things that came up for us a lot was that it was really easy to get, you know, electrical contractors to what I say, get the stuff in the ground. Um, but when we started to experience non-electrical issues from our charging infrastructure, it was, it was painful. Um, we had to reach out to our electrical contractors to see if they would download our app, um, if they would get an electric vehicle. Um, we had to sometimes ask our customers, our site hosts, to cycle breakers for us or to recreate issues. And when I saw that this was something that became a, a normal thing, not only for EV Connect, but honestly for the industry, we were seeing this, I knew that there was no possible way our industry could really be what it needed to be to be prepared for mass EV adoption. And mind you, this was about almost five years ago, um, prior to where a lot of car OEMs uh, were making these commitments, but I knew that we had to figure it out. And so when I left uh, EV Connect, I actually started to volunteer um, at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, where I wrote a curriculum, um, really just super basic, all of the random things that I had learned um, about the industry on, on how things work, who are the players. And I um, had the opportunity to teach that at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. And that's actually where I met my co-founder who is um, in, on the call today as well, Yvette Ellis. And she had just spent the last 10 plus years with the US Department of Labor's Job Corps system where she worked on this alongside car OEMs to develop out workforce development programs for communities. So understanding what did a major car OEM need for talent and then understanding in a community, how can I properly source that talent and get these, these folks aligned? And so when I spoke to Yvette about the opportunity of figuring out how do we solve for finding a workforce that could fix the issues we are experiencing and do it in such a way that made sense business-wise. And the reason why I harp on the, the business case and not necessarily saying the equitable case, because to me, good business includes equity, right? I think that this ideal that these things are apart from one another is weird, mainly because eventually, if we don't treat people correctly, or if we don't take care of citizens, or we don't give people the fair opportunity to participate, that is still a cost, right? And one of the things about business is being profitable, so just because you're profitable on the front end does not mean that you're profitable on the back end. And so that's why we saw having local jobs, having good paying jobs was the best business case for Charger Help. And so today we're so proud that um, our customers really valued that about us, right? That we have customers that are currently not on here, which range from um, Shell and EVGo, EV Connect, ABB, Tritium. Um, these folks that said that we want to work with you because of the types of jobs you've created because it slows down on retention, right? And so that to me spoke volumes, not only to the industry, but also pointing back to that this ideal of good business um, incorporates so many of the things that can be easily talked about. And it talked about in a business sense that people naturally identify equity with being good business. And these things are not synonymous and they're not nice to haves and they're not things that only nonprofits do. These are things that are actually going to push, you know, our businesses forward. And we have a really neat opportunity to do that um, with the EV charging um, landscape. 
So today, um, I would love to share the Charger Help story with you all. I would love to explain to you the EV charging ecosystem because I think a lot of times people don't really understand how complex it actually is. I, I will then go into what is the current state of EV charging. And then I wanna propose this wild ideal that there should be a dedicated workforce to take care of our stations, which we call EVSE technicians. And as we close out, I really want to leave you with um, this ideal and really um, this like call to action to support a standard called EVSE operations and maintenance. Um, and then we'll go through any questions that you all may have at the end, but it's going to be a great time. I'm super excited to be here with you all. Um, and so I'm going to first start off with a, a really cool video. We, we um, just as a setup, we recruited 20 technicians back in April um, of this year. We had 1,600 people apply. Um, my awesome co-founder ran that entire program of trying to figure out how do we identify talent that would be successful in this job and how do we remove barriers to not leave talent on the table. Um, so this video is about three minutes long and I'm going to get right into it and then I will follow up with the ecosystem. At Charger Help, we are setting the standard for fixing electric vehicle charging stations. And we're doing it two really cool ways. One, we're utilizing technology in order to enable on-demand repair of EV charging stations. And two, we're providing real green jobs to folks all across the United States. The great thing about the Charger Help training is that it's only three weeks. The first week, all of our technicians get their safety license. The second week, we teach them the ins and outs of open charge point protocol, which is just the language that every single charging station speaks. And then the third week, we bring them all here to our headquarters in Los Angeles to give them the opportunity to meet with our customers in order for them to get hands-on training. We don't have to do any other training after that because the Charger Help app enables all of our technicians to know exactly what to do when they go on site. Here at Charger Help, we're really interested in creating close partnerships with our customers. Because technology is evolving so quickly over time, it's important for us to be on the bleeding edge with you so that we can quickly fix, resolve issues, whether that's hardware or software. What we are really excited about here at Charger Help is our technicians and our team. Our technicians start off at $30 an hour. They receive full health benefits and most exciting, they get shares in Charger Help, the company. I think it's kind of wild that I didn't really understand work-life balance and so I started making a middle-class income. And so one of the things that it's able to happen when you make good money is that you have time to think about your body and your mind. And so at Charger Help, we not only you know, pay an equitable wage, but we want to introduce our employees into ways that they can take care of their body and mind. Because we're more than just a paycheck, um, more than just fixing charging stations at the end of the day and at the center for people. It's been really welcoming and fun. I've had a lot of fun getting to know everybody. Uh, different personalities are bringing out different parts of me, and I really love that. And getting to know uh, the background of everybody and what they're bringing to the table. It's really fun to find that um, camaraderie with everybody. We're committed to ongoing training, ongoing collaborations, so that we can all achieve more and provide the best quality and service and safety that the industry has ever seen. We're really excited to share this with our technicians. We really believe in equity and not just having uh, good folks work for us, but being good employers and providing for our employees. So if you're planning to be a part of the Charter Health team, you can look forward to good pay, good people, and a good time. I always tell Yvette, um, <laughs> after she says a good time and the guy laughs, I think it's great. And also, Yvette and I just had this conversation about 
once you take a picture um, in, in a, um, a dress or something, then you have to like switch it up. I didn't realize I was wearing the same dress as that video. Um, but but yeah, so just wanted to, to highlight um, that that what our training was, and I'll get right back into the ecosystem. I think my screen is doing something funky, so one moment. Okie dokie, thank you. Here we go. Okie dokie. All right. So, so we do a lot of cool stuff, but I really wanted to, uh, to, to give you some foundation on why it takes all of this, right? Like, why is it its own job? And, and why do we have to use technology? And, and why do we need to use a certain group of folks? So um, if you're not familiar with the system, I'm going to go through the system um, right now. And so some of the things to know is that there are a lot of players in the field, right? We have folks that are station locators, and these this is a full time job um, or a full time company, which their sole mission is to aggregate where stations are located. You have folks that are called network providers, and these folks, their sole mission, right, is to connect stations to EV drivers and and, and use the cloud in order to honestly regulate and, and protect the grid, and then also to have a great driver experience. You have car manufacturers, which makes the car. Um, you have electric vehicle charging station manufacturers. So these are folks that are only making stations, meaning that they're not network providers, that they're not car manufacturers, and they're, they're not station locators. The only thing that they do is make stations. And then we have electrical contractors, and these are the folks that are putting these things in the ground. Um, and some of the names that might be familiar to you, right? Station locators, um, plug share is one that um, EV drivers use all of the time. That's actually where what a lot of our technicians use and I use myself. Um, car manufacturers, as you'll notice, um, I should have Tesla in multiple boxes, but Tesla is something what's called a vertically integrated um, um, platform. And so they make their car, they have the software and they make the stations. And so that way, if there's any types of issues that happens, being able to get to a resolution um, of those things come very quickly. But on the other end of that, you have network providers such as EV Connect and, and Green Lots, where they had the opportunity to actually install uh, their software in many different types of manufacturers. And they do that by utilizing a uh, um, software protocol that's called Open Charge Point Protocol. And so when you start having different folks work on something and that there has to be a level of cooperation in how you define the language um, and how you do the protocol. That's where we see some of these inflection points or some of these areas of opportunity where things don't always go as, as, as we think that it should go. And then um, some of the major electrical contractors are Cumerit and, and Rosenden and some folks in Black and Beach. But these folks are electrical contractors, so their sole purpose is to get stuff into the ground. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that with EV charging stations, the number one issues that they experience are non-electrical. 80% of the issues that we see do not involve major electrical issues. Um, they are software, firmware, um, communication issues. And so these are just some types of charging stations. So Kidget, um, they make their own uh, station and their own software. Um, then you have folks like ChargePoint, which today they, they don't necessarily make their own charging station, um, but they have their own software and they only typically use one provider for their charging station. And then you have folks, like I said, with EV Connect, where you'll see here, these are both um, EV Connect software stations. One is uh, their software is being shown on a BTC power station. And another one, uh, their software is being shown on an EV box station. And the way that the drivers are able to utilize these stations, no matter the manufacturer, is through their the mobile app. Um, and the other thing that's quite interesting is that um, these stations also, the way that they communicate back to the cloud is traditionally um, on one um, um, cell phone provider. So for instance, EV Box traditionally uses T-Mobile as its communication platform, and BTC Power traditionally uses Verizon. 
where we get into issues, which we'll get onto later, is that if you have a cell phone, you know that depending upon where you are in the U.S. or even if you take a step step back or or a couple steps over, um, that cell phone quality, that communication, um, it's impacted, and we see that happen a lot with these charging stations, specifically or especially when um, the manufacturer is only using one cell phone provider. And then Tesla, so a vertically integrated solution. So that means that the car is made by Tesla, the charging station is made by Tesla, and also the software is made by Tesla. And so what is the current state of EV charging? Um, what we started to see at the top of January was a lot of pilot program reports. So there were a lot of utilities that had initial funding um, in order to install EV charging stations across the U.S. So some of those pilots came out of Southern California Edison, um, Bay Area, I think, yeah, I think the Bay Area also had some pilots as well. We saw pilots in Nipa Nicerta. And then we also saw uh, this a Vista pilot report, which called specifically um, out, right, what was the uptime and online time of charging stations. And on average, outside of, of Vista, but with the other pilots, we saw that anywhere between 25 to 30 percent of the stations um, was offline um, at any given time. And it's important here to pause to understand the difference between uptime and the station being online. So. Stations that are online means that they can communicate back to the cloud. Why is that important? The, the core reason why we have smart stations is in order to protect the grid, right? Is in order to do demand response, in order to do load management. So when the stations is not online, meaning that it's not communicating to the cloud in order to receive um, any type of protocols, that means that it's not able to do that. However, there are plenty of stations which go into a default mode where it will still um, give a charge to a driver, even though it is not communicating back to the cloud. Why is that a problem? <laughs> what ends up happening, and especially as we go into mass EV adoption, if we don't pay close attention to this, you will have too much demand on the cloud and no way to regulate it, right? And then we were also seeing that in these reports, that resolution time was anywhere between 15 to 30 days. When we went out to do some of our initial pilots in early of last year, we actually had site hosts who had ripped stations out of the ground and put them into a facility closet because they consistently went offline and they consistently had driver complaints and no one was coming out to fix them. And then something that we, I've already said a lot is that 80% of the issues that we were seeing in the pilot reports were non-electrical, um, but instead they were communication, firmware, and software. And we saw that this directly tied into why the stations were left offline for so long. And it was because a lot of the warranty that was sold underneath pilot programs did not include labor warranty only. Most of the warranty was sold was parts and labor. And so if the issue was communication, firmware, and software, that is not a parts issue. So it is not covered underneath the parts and labor warranty. And so therefore, those stations were left offline unless the site host opted to pay in order to have someone come out. And so this is my, my little diagram of just helping people understand, like, why the cloud is so important, right? So this is here we call a, um, like a dummy station, right? So you have the electric vehicle um, is communicating to the EV charger, um, and then it's you know sharing information to the to the meter, which then the meter is sharing information with the electric utility. So there is no cloud component, right? But then when we insert the cloud. Um, we have a lot that's happening, right? And then the cloud becomes the center of everything. So the cloud controls the transaction processing as well as what's going on with the bank, right? If you have any type of pricing policy, um, the cloud is communicating to the service center to let you know that, hey, this station is experiencing an issue. Can you help me? Um, the cloud is also communicating back to the network administer, administrator, whether that's a utility provider or or a EV Go or a Green Lots. And then it's also communicating back to the, the utility. And what's very interesting here is that these are all um, um, bi-directional communication, right? These things have to happen together. And all of this, in order for stuff to work, it has to get back to the actual charging station, which relies on cell phone service or some type of internet connection, which then also <laughs> relies on a smartphone application. So you see that this simple break in not having the cloud 
not having the station communicate back to the cloud due to a fault on the cell phone side or on the internet connection side is a huge, huge issue. And so leads me right into why EBSC technicians. <laughs> um, what Yvette and I wanted to solve was finding the right workforce for the problem, right? We know, right, that these stations have a lot of non-electrical issues. However, safety is of the most utmost important to us. We also know that we are dealing with electricity. However, our technicians going on to be a full-on electrician, especially as we transition people into green jobs, which those certified electricians are typically a five-year program, we knew that everything that an electrician knew was not all important in order to solve the problems that we were seeing on the charging stations. What was of the most importance was that our technicians understood electricity could be certified in being safe, right? And so what Yvette actually did at the top of last year was work with the US DOL to ensure that the, the qualifications and the job descriptions and the trainings that we came up with could be certified. So today, the e EVSC technician is, is recognized underneath the US DOL um, ONET code of um, 49-2095. And that falls under electrical and electronic repairs, um, but now it's starting to incorporate right information technology. So it creates this bridge, which we're seeing from smart devices, you know, that's coming about everywhere. And so it's really this ideal of, of a hybrid between a software engineer that can troubleshoot software issues, is okay with getting dirty and understands electrical safety. And when we saw when we really took time to create this position to, to, to support the infrastructure, we were able to create a larger pipeline to workforce and an easier transition to work. So today our technicians um, fall either in between X oil and gas, X telecommunications, um, and then also folks that have worked at factories, right? But not necessarily on the factory lines, but they were the folks that were actually fixing the smart machinery there. And so having these three groups, which are currently, you know, facing a lot of, of, um, of layoffs, right? Easily move into this industry, right? Was very important to us. And so for us, right, it was safety first. So we, we follow all OSHA protocols. Um, all of our technicians are certified with the NFPA 70E, which is a certification that's granted by the National Fire Protection Association for electrical safety in the workplace. Um, and then we also have all of our technicians get lockout tag out, which is actually under um, one of the, the OSHA 10 um, certifications. And so by solving for that, right, getting the right workforce, we have to solve for the other part. So today, when my technician gets on site, or any technician, even if it's an electrical contractor gets on site and they're facing an issue, about 70% of the time, specifically with DC fast chargers, they would give a call to what we call a network operations center. And this is the person that is reading the code that the station is um, putting out. And my technician may be on the phone one to two hours. And what's happening is, is that knock is going through different workflows to figure out how to fix the problem. Because today there is no clear guidance on troubleshooting, right? There is no direct pathway that when you receive an error code, you know exactly what to do. And a lot of that is because this technology is ever evolving and it won't stop evolving. Today, I was on a panel with the CEC to talk about a new standard that's coming in with um, having the vehicle do a handshake with the charging station. And so every single day technology is evolving. So being able to troubleshoot these issues um, is a lot more complex than people think. And in the past, prior to Charger Help, there wasn't an operations and maintenance entity that was aggregating data in such a way that would allow network providers and manufacturers to build smarter and better technology. But today, when, when our technicians are showing up on site, they utilize the Charger Help app. And so even if that knock is giving a pathway or workflow that, that results in not solving the problem, we are still bringing in that data. And so that way, the next time we go out to that station or receive that error code, we know not to do that pathway, right? 
or right, we recorded a pathway that did work. So we know to do that pathway. And ideally over time, we will be able to come to troubleshooting guidances faster by leaning into machine learning, by leaning into coming up with an algorithm that understands how to receive more data and adapt itself as we get on site and gather um, more, go to more service calls and gather more data. And today, what we've been able to do, right, we're in about 11 states, we service about 20,000 charging stations, we've been able to deploy within one day and fix stations within one to two days by being able to aggregate this data and learn by sitting on top of so many different manufacturers and network providers. And so this brings me to, to close to my conclusion and, and very interested in hearing your thoughts um, is, is, is really my call to action. Um, for this group and what I've been talking about, I feel like for the last month now, is setting a standard, well, setting the standard for operations and maintenance. And, and the, the reason behind this, right, is that as an industry, we will not be able to hit our goals of mass EV adoption if consumers do not trust our product. I was on the panel earlier today, the gentleman stated, Oh, yeah, like um, the state of the infrastructure isn't um, hurting EV drivers because typically the EV driver would just get rerouted to another charging station. I said, when I drove a gas powered car, never in my life did I call Chevron because the gas pump didn't work and they routed me to a gas pump down the street. And so we have to take the current state of our infrastructure extremely seriously and see that this number 25 to 30 percent may not seem huge right now but after the seven billion dollar investment plus all the other investments that are coming how big will that take how big of a number will that be if we don't start incorporating standards now so our standards really that we're pushing for are really addressing two things one it's the workforce we believe that there is opportunity to stand up good paying jobs and to allow for a more just transition for a lot of the folks that are coming out of oil refineries and other folks that are being laid off in order to safely operate on EV charging stations. We want our tier one technicians that work with level one and level two stations to yes, have an OSHA 10, have a lockout tag out, have electrical safety awareness and have an NFPA 70E. And for our tier two technicians, which are working on a high voltage, we want our DC fast charger customers to provide basic training on how to you how to fix their stations, hands-on training that they should offer this. And for our tier three, which are typically our technicians that are working with the heavy duty fleet and then also working on these DC fast chargers, we want our medium and heavy duty customers to provide training. And so when we see that, when we, 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 we allow, right, we work together to come up with training and to use a lot of this, the, the safety protocols that are already out there, we allow for safety to be first. And then we're able to sit at this really cool intersection of IoT and electricity in a safe way. And then some of the best practices that we've seen, which I'm happy to pass along this deck, and these are a lot coming from some of our customers and our technicians, right, is, is, is being able to establish a standard of best practices for the industry. And one of the biggest ones for me was um, being able to, to analyze test data, right? If so much of the stations are not communicating back to the cloud, you think about the amount of data that we're able to receive when we're on site and, and being able to create such a way that we can get this data back to our customers. And then if folks don't use Charger Help, whatever company that they're using, that should also be a standard for them if we want to be able to hit the numbers that we want to and ensure trust inside of and in, in, from our drivers. And so to me, the, the um, global future of electrified mobility is yes, let's go forth and let's get this stuff in the ground, but let's protect our investments and let's ensure that we do it in a responsible way and, and, and create good jobs. And so the last thing that I want to leave with you is that, you know, we went over the Charger Help story. We started in January of 2020, did a very cool round of $4.25 million, uh, currently servicing stations across 20,000 20, stations across 11 states. Um, we talked a little bit about the EV charging ecosystem and how complex it is and how there's such an opportunity for operations and maintenance providers um, to, to be able to really bind a lot of this stuff together and protect the investments. We talked about the current state of EV charging and, and really led us into why EVSC technicians 
are the folks that are best aligned um, in order to take care of our infrastructure. And then my call to action to you, right, is that if you are in rooms um, that, that are creating EV charging programs, to take a step back and to think about, yes, let's create spend for installation, but how are we going to protect the infrastructure once that spend is done? And the last thing that I want to do is to share this final video with you all before I open it up with questions, um, which highlights um, the good business that Charger Help is hoping to establish um, here in the EV industry. When we think of technology, we tend to focus on the product. But here at Charger Help, we understand that the product means nothing without the people. Like the people who get up and commute to work at 5 a.m. Or the people who understand what it takes to get the job done. Yeah, that's our type of people. The type that daydream on their lunch break of how to wake the world a better place and how we can do their part. We love those type of people because those type of people understand the importance of family and the power of community. Those are the people who still find their reasons to smile despite how their day went. And when we have those type of people, we can have one goal. And for Charger Help, at the end of the day, we know that when it's time to get the job done, if our people are good, then the service we will provide is good. And when the service we provide is good, then business is good. And we all love good business. And of course, here at Charger Help, we understand the importance of good business, good service, good people. Well, thank y'all so much for your time. And yeah, I would love to take any questions. Thank you so much, Camille. Uh, I just have to say the videos speak to me. You know, you've done a good job when videos kind of give you goosebumps. Um, so your marketing team or whoever does that really nailed it. Thank you for sharing those with, with us. Um, we have some great comments. Tom even just said compelling story and presentation. Well done. So thank you again for sharing all of that with me. I'm going to work my way down the questions. And also please for everyone else, make sure that you're adding them to the chat for me. Um, first question is from Linda, who is on our staff. Very inspiring. Does your company service residential EV charging in multifamily buildings, apartments, and condos? So today we, so we work directly with the manufacturers. Um, that's our first contracts and software providers. So they have stations there, then we take care of it. Today, most of the contracts that have come out that our manufacturers are taking care of didn't include maintenance for residential charging. So haphazardly, we are not able to, but we're pushing for right this ideal that we can be able to take care of more things. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're struggling with that too in our own work. Um, Bill Hilton is asking, how do you screen candidates for the basic skills needed to learn to be EVSC techs and follow up? Does Charger Help have any direct or nearly direct competitors? Sure. Um, so a lot of the screening came down from, um, actually came was built out by, by my co-founder, Yvette. And what we did was we looked at what made a good technician and we started from there. So because a lot of the issues that you experience in the field um, rely on you being resourceful, being patient, um, on you being able to identify patterns, we created a, it's a two month recruitment process, uh, which is quite interesting. But an example of, of was very helpful to us is that a part of our recruitment process, when we get towards the end, we bring the technicians and this was all virtual. So into this virtual space where there was about five of them and we give them a case study. And so usually we ask them to walk us through what are the five best next steps and everyone in the room has to agree on it. And we don't care what their five next steps are, but there's a facilitator in the room and we're watching how they interact with one another. Because the most important thing with a technician one is that like you do have to be a little bit outspoken, you have to be respectful and you have to be able to 
um, work with one another. And so we found out so many things about someone's personality, how they interact. Do they cut people off? Are they rude? Um, just from some of those spaces. So these are some of the things that we've been really trying to figure out, you know, how do you identify good talent? How do you assess for it? And how do you not leave talent on the table? And so it's an ever-changing process for us, but it's something that I'm a vet, my co-founder spends a lot of time on. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is that that case study, right, that came about because a lot of my friends, they went on to be consultants at these big firms. And that's a part of a lot of those things is going through case studies, understanding your personality, because I could teach you the technical skill through the mobile app. What I can't teach you um, is, is patience and being kind and being a customer focused individual. You, you are speaking directly to me. Oh. <laughs> it's like always top of mind for me as we're growing our own team. So, oh my gosh, yeah. Um, next question. Do you have any comments on the infrastructure bill and the increased funding for electric vehicles? Why don't we start there and then I'll go on with that question. Sure. So for the infrastructure bill, we actually had a great opportunity um, last, I think it was last week, we were able to meet with the Secretary of Energy and, and, the, and the, well, the VP was there, Kamala Harris, VP Harris, um, to talk to them about some of our concerns with the infrastructure bill. So the first concern that had come about early on was that um, there was a line item in there that required the folks that did operations and maintenance were EVITP certified. And if you're not familiar with EVITP, it comes directly from um, IBW and you have to be a certified electrician and they were putting that language in there for operations and maintenance, which didn't make any sense. And from our experience inside of the states that we work in, most of the time certified electricians or folks that were going through that program were predominantly middle-class white men. Mm -hmm. And which is not, a, not an issue, only if you create that as the only qualification and that pipeline resembles the only certain type of person, then we have to take a step back and say, okay. So we were able to get that removed off of the infrastructure bill, but the other thing that we're hoping to um, add to it, right, is this operations and maintenance standard, because a lot of network providers and manufacturers has assets out there that they've received government funding from that is inoperable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is an issue. <laughs> yeah. And they keep yeah. getting money, right? And they keep getting federal spend and, and they're not taking care of their stations and they're not being held accountable. And they're our customers. And so, you know, but we can't work on their stations if they haven't allocated funding for it or they don't haven't prioritized it, right? Right. Right. I so appreciate not only your competency and confidence in your knowledge of the material, but also your passion, because I feel like the passion speaks to a lot of folks that may not understand the stuff, right? But you speaking to things that are important to them is also making a difference. So thank you for sharing it the way that you are. What do you wish there was more funding for, which we've talk, talked about a little bit, as far as increasing charging in places where it doesn't currently exist, rural areas, access for renters? Yeah, I think that um, two things. One, I think that it would be very interesting to have some of these communities come up with what mobility or charging may look like for them. Like in LA, I always say we don't need more cars. We think like even if they're electric, we just don't need, like we need mobility solutions, right? And so I think that it would be really interesting to see like communities do design thinking or to figure out what does mobility look like for them and allowing people to solution for the problems that they're experiencing. I think that would be amazing. Um, little be known, Charger Help was actually born out of a design thinking session that I did haphazardly, right? And it was because it was the first time that Google, I'm from South Central Los Angeles, Google Startups did a design thinking event in, in South Central. I went there as, as, a, um, as an advisor and then in line had this random ideal, pitched ideal and won, right? But it was learning about design thinking. It was having the backing and the resources and then look at Charger Help, right? And that happened in November, 2019. So I think that there's a huge opportunity for us not to see folks from rural communities or these other communities as folks that need technology to be brought to them, but maybe, right, they may have solutions of their own that can be brought to other people or that can help solve some of the problems that they see in their own community, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember your second question because I went on a tangent, but yeah. Uh, where it doesn't currently exist. I, I think you touched on that, yeah. rural areas, yeah, great. renters. 
Um, I'm hoping at the end, Linda can share a little bit about what she's doing in her work for, for renters right now, um, which she made a comment for in the chat too. Next question is from Ron Snow. With many auto manufacturers launching EV cars, is there compatibility between chargers? That is, can a Tesla charger work with GM? Will a Ford charger port with VW, et cetera? We know, we know some of that is not compatible, but if you can go into detail, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen is that folks are looking to work together. Like that's what I've seen from, from the Teslas to the GMs to Fords. Everyone is trying to figure it out. I don't know how soon it will happen, but I think that there is this ideal um, that it feels a little bit less competitive when it was a huge, bigger land grab. But I think because there's so much opportunity right now, folks are looking to see what it would look like to have um, – more interoperability um, between the connectors and the cars. And that's been very exciting um, to hear the beginning talks of that. And that's the extension is what can increase that compatibility, things like adapters. Yeah, I think it's going to be two things. I think that a lot of stuff is going to come down to customer choice, right? I think after a while, people are not going to deal with some of the state of the infrastructure. Sector. So you'll, you, I think you will see people either combined or fall off. So I think that will have to happen. Um, and I think the second part of that is, is going to be also EV drivers once again um, voicing their opinion on, on the state of the infrastructure. And if it's hard, you know, for them to find a charge because the next the charging station next to them doesn't accept their plug, right? I think right. a lot is going to come down to EV drivers using their voices um, to, to impact um, how these major folks are moving. It's a great response. Um, Bill reminded me to check in about his second question was, do you have any competition? So today, haphazardly, our competition ends up being electrical contractors. And the reason that is, is because um, most of the RFPs, installation and operation and maintenance are combined. So they're one line item. So an EC wins both. Um, but then what we found is that a lot of these things don't want to do the work, so they'll give us the work. But we've been really advocating to split those, split the line items up. And that also allows for there to be spent later, later on for operations and maintenance. But I will say the more that I go out and talk about this problem, I always tell people I'm just creating my own competition. So who knows by the end of this call, someone here is going to start a, a charger, help me or something. <laughs> That's the beauty and also side <laughs> of open sourcing intelligence. Yeah, we welcome yeah, competition. No. Yeah, thank, thank you. I mean, honestly, we probably need more of that. And yeah. Collaborate, right? Like serving different areas and using expertise in different areas. And we don't talk about that stuff enough. Um, thank you so much. Okay, so the next question is a follow-up from Ron. He wants to add that when Charger Help Tech comes to install a charger setup for a business or apartment complex, what kind of chargers are installed? So we, we don't install chargers at all. We do believe that's electrical work. So we do not install chargers. We only maintain them. Do you have any specific companies that you work with? Or are you kind of agnostic? Oh, to, yeah. So today, yeah, we're completely agnostic. We literally work with everyone except Tesla, which I've been working with. I saw with. the logos on, yeah, that was, that was interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, this is so lovely. So would you mind if we shared a little bit about the work that we're doing around the access? I, I, one, think you would really love it. And I think we would also benefit from having more of your participation in that conversation. Um, Linda, do you want to share a little bit about your EV access? And then I want to take just a couple minutes for that and open it up to any other questions. Please put those in the chat while Linda's doing her, her update. Yeah, thanks, Lauren, and thanks, um, Camille. I was so inspired by your presentation. I really see that you're centering equity at the heart of what you're doing, and I see it's about reducing barriers, expanding access. So I just really appreciate that. Your leadership in this space is so valued and important. Um, and I see a lot of synergy that we're doing with the EV Charging Access for All Coalition. So it's a coalition of over 100 groups, including faith communities, labor, um, business, um, customers, and environmental justice communities working to get the Cal Green Code for residential charging in multifamily buildings, so apartments and condos, to be equitable. And so as I'm really call me not know, but right now, since 2015, every single family home built in the state of California is pre-wired for EV charging, but only 10% of apartments and condos are. And so we've been pushing the um, agencies to increase this so that there's equity. So folks that rent can also have EVs. And so 
What we're doing right now is really putting um, an ask out to the governor, to Governor Newsom, to stand up and say, you put down this wonderful vision of all zero emission vehicles by 2035 in our state, but people will have to have a place to charge them. And the buildings that are getting built today will still be around at that time. They're gonna last for decades. And so we are doing a, um, a campaign to ask Governor Newsom today we met with some of his staffers. We are amping up the pressure because the agencies aren't listening. We've submitted thousands of public comments. The code has not been uh, modified. So I'm gonna drop into the chat, Actera's um, call to action. This is a really handy tool. It's an it's a email to Governor Newsom. People can just click on that link it opens up an email pre-written to him. You can send it as it is, or you can personalize it and say why EV charging access is important to you. And so I know that's more on the residential side of you're focusing on you know, public charging, but I think both are really important and um, we're all working for equity. And it's really, um, I'll say one last thing, it's an issue of systemic, I think, racial and class um, discrimination that the single family home owners are treated differently than renters and apartments and condos. And you know, predominantly it's people of color, low-income people who are living in, in multifamily buildings and they're being locked out of access to the most affordable EV charging at home. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, Camille, if there's time for a response, but I'd love to see if you could support this and other people. And of course, you'll need time to, you know, investigate all the details, but the concept we're trying to work on is getting EV charging in every new building. So every condo and apartment owner has access. No, it's very interesting. And my head of government relations is also on the call. So I know Samantha, pick up the link and look at it. <laughs> no, it's very interesting. And we actually have a report that um, we, we're trying to figure out who we're going to push it out through. But we went out and surveyed all these charging stations, right? Some of them are in multi-unit dwellings. What's going to be very interesting is that where have they been broken the longest, right? So even while you, which might be interesting, you know, why we pushed for, yes, let's get them installed into code. And then also let's ensure that they have operations and maintenance policies on them. So they, they work after we get them installed and into code. So yeah, no, definitely we'll be in touch. I love that. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks, Linda. Are there any more questions from the group? If not, I have a couple of questions that can, that can close us out. Okay, here we go. We have one more. Uh, as an EV owner from Ellen, with a mere 100 mile range, I'm always nervous about driving up to the city 40 miles. Are there user interface issues you think need to be improved for folks like me who don't know how to trust the charging maps and the charging station's usability when I get there? Do you recommend that I join all the platforms? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> I know it's like, well, here's, this is, I mean, like, I'm not even gonna answer your question. I'm gonna add to it because so, <laughs> So Samantha and I, um, we, so she's had a government relations, we had to do some work in, in New York and she's in DC. So for, it was National Drive Electric Week. So we're like, um, and she's, we were like, okay, this is her first time driving an electric car. So like, okay, like, let's, let's run an electric car. Let's drive from DC to New York. We'll document our like experience. And like I said, we don't even work on Tesla stations. So it would make sense for us to get a car to use the o OCPP stations. But we really went back and forth on getting a non-Tesla car because we were afraid of the infrastructure. And even being two women traveling um, later in the day, getting stuck somewhere yeah. on the highway in some of these areas where you saw stations that don't have good lighting, that are in the middle of nowhere. Like, so I think that I, I'm really big, right? I'm just over here drinking my own Kool-Aid too. But I'm really big on this operations and maintenance standard, right? Like I think that the operations and maintenance standard is going to push people to fix these stations. And I think that getting money set aside for operations and maintenance is going to help that. We do know that Ford and some folks, I think GM, they're creating like their own like maps to ensure. But the thing is like, it can still be mapped and you get there, it doesn't work. And I think like the bigger issue to me is just like holding people accountable for broken stations. The Tesla stations typically work because they have people on staff to go out and fix the stations. We don't really see that on the other end, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are my two cents. So I agree with you. I don't know. And <laughs> I, yeah, it's, it's really bad. It, it's no, really bad. I, I, have, I have four charging apps just in case for the Bay Area, right? I mean, I think that's part of it. It's not a good solution, but it is a solution. Yeah. So, yeah. so my questions for you are bias because of course I resonated with some of the things that you were saying on the the human capacity front where do you see 
this work with the infrastructure bill and really, you know, building capacity in human beings to come along on the journey rather than be left behind on the journey. What is your vision and long-term thought on what this electrification charging creation for human capacity is? So much of it's already built into your work, but like, what do you see it being 10 years from now? Like, do you really fear that people are gonna just be left behind or do we have enough infrastructure to bring them along and how can we help you be successful in that work? Yeah, I think that when we think about the, the charging stations, and I think I said this before, it's like, it's, it's, the, first, it's the first like mass deployment of IoT assets publicly. Right, so it's not so like, I think a lot of people just think like, oh, they just plugs in the wall. Like actually, no, like the software in these stations are severely complex. And when we think about um, connected cities and smart cities and just the opportunity of just smart devices, period, we see that EV charging is just a step into that space. And this has been actualized for us for like the new deals that we start to get, right? We're one of the national trainers are working that through with Volvo trucks. Because now heavy and medium duty fleets, it's not about an engine. Can, yeah. you, can you troubleshoot a computer in a really large truck <laughs> and safely deal with the battery, right? And so when we think about electrifying our fleets and when we think about just like the connected cities and this the opportunity of smart technology or where the future is going, we see that that is a great opportunity to bring a lot of folks along. However, right, we we have to start figuring out different ways on workforce development. And so one of the things that, you know, we're going back out to raise next year. And one of the things that we want to build out with the technology is to start understanding how our technicians interact with it, right? So today my, my app is learning the, the station, but I want my app to understand my workforce. So we can actually do true on the job training that does not impact the customer. Mm -hmm. Right. And if we could take some of these learnings of utilizing technology for workforce on the job training to solve a lot of these software issues, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. I think that long, I think that we've moved past this space that people have to go to school for four and five years. Technology changes too quickly. Not even that it's a bad thing. It's just that what you learned four years ago, those aren't even the same stations in the ground anymore. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> At least that's come a, a long ways, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity and we're hoping to lead, to lead a lot of that and to help people start thinking about tech within workforce development. How can we also bring along our workforce development centers? Yvette has battle stories about just getting workforce development center agents, agents to understand clean tech jobs so that they mm -hmm. can advocate for it because they themselves don't understand clean tech, right? And so th I think there's a lot of work to be done, but we're very hopeful. That's amazing. And I think Ellen has a question here that touches on this too. Like, who are you specifically working with on these initiatives on the workforce development side? Do you have partners that you really lean into because they do get it? And then we should be thinking about what kind of programming aligns with their innovations too. Who, who are those that you seek out on the vocational side? Yeah, so Yvette has been, I'm pretty sure she's probably laying down and watching this or I'll tell totally, you, you know, stage, but um, Yvette has been working um, primarily with um, workforce development programs, agencies, and like partners. So for instance, the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator out of LA, and um, we work with um, um, Green City Force out of New York. Um, and then we've been, I know she's been working with Leaders Up, and there's some other like national online programs, but she has to vet them to number one, see do they have a diverse candidate pool? Because <laughs> all it was like a thing, right? For, yeah. for women and just other folks. And then also, um, are there, their candidates ready for this opportunity? Because I think sometimes people may have like other barriers, whether it's childcare or whether it's, you know, working through some type of like getting their driver's license. Like, did the Workforce Development Center prepare this candidate to be successful in this role? Because the other thing, like sometimes we give people opportunity when they're not ready and it's a disservice to them as well. Um, so that does a phenomenal job of finding these, these agencies and then also vetting them, right? To ensure that we'll get the right candidate pool um, so that we can be successful so that we can keep hiring people. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's something we face too. Thank you, Camille. This has been phenomenal. I keep seeing the questions and comments come in and they're so positive and appreciative of your time and your passion and your knowledge. We cannot thank you enough for spending your Wednesday evening with us and dedicating the time. I know you've got to a flight. Right? Yeah, catch a flight. So I, I will close this out exactly on time. Perfect timing. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It was a pleasure to, to facilitate your questions and to see your participation. We cannot thank you enough. Camille, safe travels. Everybody enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening. Thank you to our sponsors, of course. We can't do any of this without you. Um, hope to see you in the spring in our next series. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye, Camille.